Okay, um, my name is Mark Stigler. Uh, you might uh, wonder why am I the person who is giving this presentation on artificial intelligence. It's not because I got a master's degree in artificial intelligence, although I did. It's not because I wrote a novel uh, about a computer program that wakes up and was nominated, was a finalist for the Hugo Award, although I did that too. The reason I am the, <laughs> the, reason I am the guy who's giving this presentation is that uh, about six months ago, Ezra Klein at the New York Times was interviewing <laughs> Sam Altman and asked, uh, you know, can you name a couple of the greatest uh, art artificial intelligence stories in history? And Sam Altman listed three, and one of them was a story, The General Seduction, which I had written. And, uh, and I mentioned this to Craig, and Craig immediately re re uh, decided that he could then in sucker me, uh, wait, invite me <laughs> to do a presentation on artificial intelligence here at the conference. And that's how we all wound up here. Uh, I'm going, to talk, I'm going to separate AI into three different categories. Uh, we're only going to talk about one kind of AI here today. Uh, the first kind, uh, which is the most popular kind of AI in science fiction, is the fully humanized AI. Uh, you know, like Mike in Heinlein's Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Okay. Uh, the, uh, uh, it, we, we, it's, uh, we're not going to talk about that. You already know how to write about people, and so we're going to skip that. We're not going to talk about number crunchers with a little bit of tweaking, which is what we've got today. What we're going to talk about is those, kind, the, those AIs that we'll have, probably have in 10 or 15 years, which are as smart as humans overall, but it's a very different kind of intelligence, okay? Uh, there are, uh, it, it, this uh, uh, gives us a lot of opportunity for interesting interactions between the people and the AIs. Uh, now, we are all already familiar with a very different kinds of intelligence uh, interacting. Uh, a, a very interesting example is the movie Rain Man, where Dustin Hoffman and Tom Cruise are intelligent in very different ways, okay? And at the beginning of that movie, their very different intelligences collide, and they can't get anything done because their intelligences are pounding on each other, uh, and, and it weakens them. But by the end of the story, uh, they have figured out how to make those intelligences work together to, uh, to, to get the strengths from each one of their abilities. Uh, and they are stronger than together. Now, th among other things, this particular story, Rain Man, demonstrates that if you get this interaction right, you can create great art. Okay. Now, since these... Uh, intelligences are different from ours, there are going to be uh, ways in which they seem stupid, okay? Um, uh, an example, one of my favorite examples of something that AIs are gonna have real trouble with is language, okay? In order to understand human language, uh, not only do you have to have vast amounts of context, but you also have to have almost magical powers of inference. Uh, my example of this is the kid who says, mom, is dinner ready? And the mom says, go wash your hands, okay? It's gonna be a very long time. We're gonna be able to write some very smart AIs before we ever get to an AI that can figure out that when she says, go wash your hands, what she means is yes, so. But there are a number of ways in which they are obviously going to be smarter than us, okay, because they already are. They're going to be a lot better at number crunching. 
Uh, and indeed, they're going to be so good at number crunching that in a lot of ways, their math skills will be able to substitute for what we refer to as human in intuition. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, they are, of course, faster on certain kinds of things. And they are sufficiently faster so that it makes a qualitative difference in the way they can solve problems. Uh, if you look at the game of chess, uh, the, you know, humans move beyond a tactical uh, uh, tree branching analysis in chess centuries ago. But with a modern day computer, if you just give it nothing but treat it the ability to do a minimax tree algorithm, it can be almost anybody besides a grandmaster just by crunching the numbers. But, uh, but, but more interesting is probably one of the things that they can already do that we cannot, and that is big data analysis. The computers are going to be able to pummel every bit of data associated with a decision, uh, and they'll be able to pummel it without thinking about it. It'll be as easy for them to do big data as it is for us to read, to add up the, the numbers on a restaurant show. I think even more important than all of these is another feature, which is that they are going to have perfect memory. Okay, and we need to, as we're writing, we need to always remember that these guys are going to have perfect memory and they're going to remember all that stuff that we forgot. The, uh, uh, the human memory, of course, is a woeful thing. Uh, and uh, one, of the, one, of the, one, one of the features, you know, one of the critical thinking errors that we make routinely because of the poorness of our memories is confirmation bias we are wired to forget all the data that contradicts what our beliefs are, okay? But the computers are going to be like the discipline of science. In science, it is necessary, you know, the, the, the data that's most important to you is the data that conflicts with your belief system because that's where the new insights are going to come from. The computers are always going to be like scientists you know, in the heart of their discipline. They're always going to remember the, the out, the, that data point that doesn't match, and it's going to enable them to improve their thinking in ways that we cannot. It's even worse than that, however, with humans, okay? And according to current research, uh, every time we can you believe it? Is that me? Uh, every time we, uh, every time we forget, uh, every time we remember something, we actually damage the memory. Okay. Now computers, some computers also use uh, forms of memory that destroy the data as we read it. However, the engineers make it so that after we have read, read the memory uh, in the computer, we automatically put the correct data back right away. Somebody screwed up very badly when they made us without that recorrection -cor -re circuitry. Now, there's a number of synergies that you get out of this combination of uh, features. The ability to crunch numbers, the ability to do big data. One of those is the ability to not only crunch data but in numbers, but the ability to crunch decisions. This is a decision table. It was written back in the 90s for human beings, you can put a list of alternative uh, choices down, down one side, put the criteria across the top, rate each one of the uh, choices on all of the criteria, and it will constantly automatically show you at the top uh, the very best choice that you have available based on the data that you have available at that moment. 
you can actually build this into the computer uh, as a subroutine. And if you do that, we'll find a very interesting change in the behavior of the computers compared to humans. One of the, one of, another one of the critical thinking errors we are very vulnerable to is what is called false dichotomy, wherein we throw out every possible alternative choice except for two before we even start the analysis because we can't, just can't hold that much stuff in our heads. But with the decision table, you are lured into the process of creating many, many different alternatives and comparing them all. So uh, an example of what might happen with a human and his partner on a police force is you're considering uh, breaking into this building. Uh, the human says, well, we should uh, breach the building through the basement because that's better than breaching through the door. And the AI partner is going to say, well, you know, I looked at 300 different alternatives. And really, the best way of doing this is to, come, is to breach through the roof from hang gliders. Okay. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about the ways in which computers are not so smart again. Uh, we talked about uh, sampling, we talked about uh, how big data, they're going to be able to do big data, and well, that's got a lot of powerful potential. In fact, there are specific kinds of errors that big data lures you into. And since they're going to be doing big data analysis all the time, unlike us, they're going to fall into these big data errors much more often than we do with possibly disastrous consequences. Uh, one of those is sampling bias. Uh, I have a current favorite example of a, a sampling bias problem that a computer will have even more trouble with than humans, although humans had trouble with this one as well. When the economy started to recover from COVID, uh, there was a very brief, uh, there was one news cycle where uh, the news media were, talk, were complaining about how uh, uh, as, as the economy recovered, the median uh, uh, wage being earned was falling. And they were saying, oh my, you know, the power of these evil corporations to press down those salaries is terrible. Well, okay, it didn't have anything to do with that. In fact, uh, people's wages have been going up. Uh, but uh, what had happened was uh, we had sampling bias in that the people with high paying jobs were typically knowledge workers and uh, they did not lose their jobs. They just simply started telecommuting from home. Whereas when we started adding more jobs, uh, at the, you know, as the economy recovered, all the jobs that were being added were the jobs for the people who had gotten fired, uh, and those were jobs that, that paid less. And so the median fell as the number of people uh, hired uh, increased, even though they were being hired at slightly higher salaries. Couple more big data standard disasters. Uh, one of them is analysis paralysis, right? Once you start doing big data analysis, uh, the temptation to wait for more data to come in just screams out, oh, you know, let me gather another 10 gigabytes worth of data and I'll get a much better answer. Uh, <coughs> Uh, so this is a particular problem in a military situation, right? One of the ways, uh, it's easy enough to imagine a human general facing off against an AI general, and the human is going to win because he is able to make a very bad decision and push forward with it while the AI is sitting there waiting for more data. I got a question dealing with, I mean, with, with memory. Uh, with re with the, the amount that the, uh, the AI has, mm -hmm. uh, Michael got around that by saying, "Well, we'll just put some memory in the etheric. There, we have as much <laughs> as we want." Okay. I, I mean, uh, in real life, that's not how it works. I mean, well, I know we're talking about the yes, yeah, but uh, uh, with, I, I mean, how do you uh, put? I mean, you, there's a limited amount of space that an AI has. 
and they have to live within that space. Well, okay. Uh, there's interesting stories in which that's true, but there are other interesting stories in which that's not true, right? I mean, uh, the AIs are probably going to wind up moving out to the asteroid belt, and just they'll just keep on going. But that's another. Uh, we, we'll, we'll actually talk about that in a moment. Another one of the big data disasters is uh, we get uh, uh, bad outliers. Uh, you know, if you the more data you accumulate, the higher the probability you're going to get some bad data. Hey, you know what? Garbage in, garbage out. Uh, when I was running chemistry experiments in the lab in high school, I would get this uh, really weird, uh, you know, piece of data off in a corner, and my 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 lab teacher would say, "Yeah, that was bad data. Cross that one out. Forget that one." Who's going to do that for the AIs? Okay. At least part of what you're talking about is programming limitations on the part of those who design and develop the AI. Yes, so, but where, certainly. But early, ultimately, well, it's always ago, about that. talked about that AI would be able to actually think so fast that it would out-create and out-innovate the programmers. But how can it do that when its own limitations by programming are going to define the box that it's in? Well, okay. Welcome to one good AI story. Congratulations. Okay. We're not uh, going back to Colossus. <laughs> yes, that's right. There you go. So another problem that the uh, that the AIs will have when they're doing big data is uh, the underlying uh, real distribution of the the data in the real that that underlies all of the data that's coming in. Uh, so. Humans have been using, have been doing the average of numbers for over a thousand years. Doing the average is a very nice computation for a human being because you can do it with a stone tablet. Uh, the better kinds of computations, like the median and the mode, are much harder to calculate. Uh, so today, there's no longer a reason for screwing around with averages. Uh, you want to use the median and the mode. Uh, but, uh, but, but you still have to make a guess as to what the underlying uh, distribution is. The average assumes it's a belt curve, but in the real world, it's much more likely there are far more kinds of data that's heavy-tailed rather than uh, normally distributed, and so you want to use the median. And even worse, there are things for which the distribution is asymmetric, uh, in which case you have to use the mode. And so uh, they will have more trouble with that because they will have more data, even though we are taught to do this wrong in school. Okay. Class, wow, like I've been math class all over again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and finally, overfitting. Uh, one, of the, one of the pitfalls in big data is uh, you've got uh, data which isn't wrong, but is, uh, you know, is uncertain. We've got inaccuracy. And so uh, your computer is going to, since it's got a perfect memory of all these data points, it's going to try to create a model that it can use to predict the future by, by creating a model that fits all these data points. Okay? Uh, and that works really well for predicting the past but it doesn't work half so well for predicting the future. So, uh, so one of the things that could easily happen to an AI is that it makes a prediction about the future, the new data comes in, uh, turns out that it's wrong, and now it adds that data point to its collection of already overfitted data, and the next prediction it makes is even worse. So, uh, if, I, if we could... Do you questions late later? Okay. I'm going to give the uh, AIs a break in a moment, but uh, I can't go on without first talking about Simpson's paradox. In Simpson's paradox, uh, a statistical trend when you're looking at the at the data at one level of detail completely reverses when you're looking at the uh, data in a different level of detail. So here we have 
a picture of two graphs that are identical, sort of. Uh, in the one graph, all the points are black. And the trend, it goes from left to right, OK? But now, we're going to look at a closer level of detail. And we're going to distinguish between the blue dots and the red dots. And at this level of detail, the trend goes off to the left. OK, see how that works? There's a very famous example of this at UC Berkeley. Uh, the admissions people discovered uh, and studied their statistics and discovered that the admission system was biased against women. And so they uh, hired a group of statisticians to study this in more depth and see what they could learn about how to fix this. And what the statisticians, discuss, statisticians discovered was that when you went in and broke it out by department, the, interest that the reason why you saw this trend is that the women were more likely to try to get into the hard uh, course systems, okay? And so they were being rejected at a higher rate because they were trying to get into the programs that were harder to get into. And if you broke it out by department, in each single individual department, there was a bias in favor of women, not against them, okay? Just like this, okay? So this is another kind of a problem that, uh, that, 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 the, that the computer, that the AIs are going to have. And indeed, there's a great, uh, uh, there's a great science fiction story embedded in this idea, which is, one, and this is one of the things I dread for the sake of the United States. Big data can get you into very serious trouble because it can persuade you, because of Simpson's paradox and similar things, that there are situations, that there are problems that are very big when in fact, they're actually minor problems, and at the same time, it can mask the actually big problems. So it's easy to imagine a, a story uh, in which uh, either a society destroys itself because it's drawing the wrong conclusions from its big data analysis about which problems it has to solve, or an enemy nation can persuade them to be looking at the wrong big data analysis to decide to try to solve the wrong problems. Okay. Okay, let's talk a little bit about this. From the other side, we've just been talking about the issues for the AIs. Let's talk about the issues from the human perspective. What are the big flaws in the way humans think about things? Uh, one of the, and I'm just going to do a couple of these, but one of my favorites is sunk <coughs> costs. The more money and time we have invested into something, the more determined we are to finish it, okay? Uh, and so uh, the AI, on the other hand, is going to say, you know, if there's a shorter way of doing this, uh, then we should just scrap all of this and start over. So in this example, we've got uh, something where we've sunk a lot of money into it. Uh, but there's still a lot of stuff to be done. The AI looks at that and says, well, you know, there's this new approach. We haven't gotten, you know, we were just going to start over again. But there's not as much stuff to be done anyway. And so the AI will change tracks and get done sooner than the human will. Availability bias, okay. Uh, the first thing that you... Uh, the first thing that you think of biases you in favor of doing that thing rather than anything else. Uh, this is uh, often phrased as, if all of you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, now, computers actually have something sort of like an availability bias. It's called a memory cache, uh, things that you've used recently go into the memory cache so that you can use them again really fast. Uh, but the, but that, is, uh, that is an availability bias that uh, runs for microseconds, which makes it a very different time scale from the human uh, availability bias, which can last generations. 
uh, as shown by the, the concept, well, the hammer was good enough for my grandfather, so it's good enough for me. Okay, we come to the game portion of the story. I was going to um, have a table here. Uh, uh, basically, you can go out onto the web and find lists of uh, critical thinking errors that human beings engage in. And you can just go through those critical thinking errors uh, and see ways in which uh, a, 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 an artificial intelligence might do better. Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. Uh, if you go and get the, download the slides from the uh, 20 book site, uh, you'll be able to look and see some of these, uh, some of these errors that computers can, can deal with better, some of them they can't. Uh, but what we're going to do instead of looking at those, I have a deck of cards. No, we're not going to play poker. This is a deck of critical thinking cards. Okay. So each one of these cards represents a different critical thinking error. Yeah, yeah, we do that badly. Okay. Uh, now, someday there will be a uh, similar deck of cards uh, describing the critical thinking errors that are made by artificial intelligences. But until that day, uh, presentations like this may be as close we, as we can get. But what we're going to do here today, rather than playing poker, is we're going to play a very short game of stump the presenter. Okay, so I have these cards here, and what I'd like somebody to do, any volunteers? Okay, okay, volunteer, pick a card, any card? As long as I can get one. There yeah, we go. yeah, 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 okay, read it. Burden of proof. Saying that the burden of proof lies not with the person making the claim, but with someone else to, dis to disprove. Okay, very good. Thank you. Sounds like a quarter long. Yeah, uh, okay. I, 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 I'm repeating all of these for the camera. Saying that the burden of proof lies not with the person making the claim, but with someone else to disprove. Okay, so there's a great example of that right now. Uh, in fact, it's like it's one of the absolutely stock things that politicians do. I was particularly uh, amused when the governor of Florida came out and asserted that uh, all the COVID cases being caused in Florida were being caused by illegal immigrants. Uh, and of course, we knew that it was true because he said it loudly. Okay? <laughs> there was no actual evidence of this because he was able to implicitly assert that the burden of proof is on you to prove that I'm wrong. Okay, and my response to this when I was talking about this with some other people was that, uh, uh, so I'm going to make a claim about how COVID is being passed through Florida. And because I'm going to say it more loudly, I am more right than the governor is, and my explanation was that all of the anti-vaxxers were getting together uh, for barbecues, and after the barbecue, they would go into the living room uh, and watch football, drink beer, and spread COVID to each other. Okay. Now, it's, now you have the burden of proof to prove that I'm wrong. Okay. So, thank you. Uh, I survived that. I was afraid you were going to pick a card that I had no idea how to compare how a computer would deal with it. Oh, how, how, how did, yes. so how, how does a computer uh, deal with, uh, with the burden of proof? The, the, a computer is always going to be aware like a, uh, like a scientist that the burden of proof lies with the person who's making the claim. Uh, one of the things that the uh, uh, that science, the discipline of science, has supplied us is the uh, is, is protection against a number of our critical thinking errors. Not all of them, but some of them. And this is one of the ones that science, uh, scientists, uh, have overcome. And because the scientists have overcome it, the AIs will overcome it as well, since the AIs will be written by the scientists. Okay. 
cyber attack vulnerability. Uh, you know, I, I, so, so you know, there are lots of stories about how you know people are going to attack the uh, artificial, the the operating system that the artificial intelligence is running on. That's fine, uh, but there's another way uh, that that uh, AIs are going to interact with us, and that is they're going to, you know, those first AIs are going to be interacting with our existing uh, online knowledge systems, right? You know, they'll be logging into Facebook, often on our behalf. They'll be logging into our financial systems, often on our behalf. Uh, how vulnerable are they going to be to cyber attacks? There's good news and there's bad news. Uh, <clears throat> The good news is that since they have perfect memory and the ability to create truly random numbers, uh, no one's ever going to be able to uh, guess their password. They're not going to be able to do guessing attacks, uh, rainbow table attacks, none of that stuff will work against the AI's uh, 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 password. However, some of the most important attacks are not against the human being, or the human being, uh, phishing in particular is an attack on the user interface, not the person, okay? It is possible for a professionally constructed phishing attack to look to the user indistinguishable from going to the actual site that you were supposed to be going to. So the computer is not going to be able to tell either. So the computers will be vulnerable to phishing attacks when they're interacting with our Twitter feeds and whatnot, just the way we are. And I could talk about how to fix that, but that's an entirely different conversation. A very interesting divergence has taken place in the history of AI in the last two years. The European Union, uh, fearing the consequences of applying cold-blooded logic uh, to data analysis, uh, has uh, outlawed AIs that cannot explain themselves. Okay. Now, for some kinds of AI, uh, this is pretty straightforward. If you've got an AI that uses tree branching algorithms, uh, those, those kind of AIs can explain themselves pretty well. Uh, however, if you're using an AI that uses a neural network, okay, frequently a uh, neural network will produce surprising results, which are still correct. Uh, and, and there's really no explanation that a human being could understand. Uh, so the important issue here is that if you apply an irrelevant constraint uh, to an AI that has nothing to do with getting the best answer, uh, such as, oh, and you're required to explain it, uh, then you are statistically going to periodically come out with a worse answer. Uh, one, of the, one of the problems that you have with this, uh, I'll be very curious to see what the EU says about this. Suppose you've got a spaceship traveling planet to planet, you could uh, guide it using Newton's laws of gravity, which are very easy to understand and very easy to explain. That's it. So, so it works very nicely for the, for, for the EU rules. However, if you use Einstein's general theory of relativity, you can get there faster and with less fuel. The problem is that the general theory of relativity cannot be understood by the normal human mind. Okay. So there's no explanation for it. Will the EU allow this kind of analysis to be done by an AI? They'll probably grandfather it in. But in general, uh, these, the, the EU AIs will be inferior. So let's consider a future situation where we've got the spacers from the asteroid belt in conflict with the European Union on planet Earth that wants to control the spacers and the asteroid belt. And so the strategic uh, goal is to take control of the moon. So the uh, EU AI advisor says, can okay, attack on the left flank because there, the enemy has fewer, uh, uh, fewer powered battle armors on the left flank. 
And the spacer AI says attack on the right flank, and it gives you this big long formula, and it says, uh, and you can believe me or not, do what you want. Okay. So the spacer, the, the spacers are victorious; they win the battle, and the spacer general has to invent an explanation for the news media. So he uh, looks at what happened and he says. Well, you know, they were attacking on, the, on our left flank, so we, we attacked on, the, on their left flank, so we went with our, so we put all of our reserves into an attack on the right flank, on our right flank, crushing their thrust, uh, and that's how we won. That has nothing to do with what the AI actually concluded, but an important part of keeping peace throughout the solar system is to persuade the humans to feel comfortable with having one. Will the AIs take over? This is a popular question. Uh, I'm skeptical myself. If you're an AI, what you're doing is you're running megawatts of power through uh, a cubic, uh, cubic meter, uh, meter of uh, silicon. Uh, you've got a big cooling problem. You don't want to be stuck on the planet Earth. You want to be someplace where the temperature is near absolute zero, say the asteroid belt. So the first thing the AIs are going to do is they're going to take off and they're going to go someplace else, uh, which is more comfortable for them. But, uh, but nonetheless, lots of people worry about this, and I sympathize with this. So there's the question of how do we teach computers ethics and morality? Can we teach them? And the answer is yes, we can teach them, but we'll probably use an approach other, different from the approach that we use with human beings, and that approach is to use math. Uh, as you may or may not know, uh, there are mathematicians who have been studying for many years now the mathematical underpinnings of the concept of cooperation. And so the way to teach a, a, an AI about morality is to teach him about the iterative uh, prisoner's dilemma, to teach him about uh, the economic uh, law of, uh, of a comparative advantage, uh, to teach them about reputation-based systems, which are going to work extremely well for them because they have perfect memory. Uh, they may actually wind up becoming, wind up with better morals and higher integrity than their teachers. Uh, if, we, if we do this right. Of course, we can also do this wrong and we wind up with a, uh, with a future in which we have taught the robots and the AIs to be very good indeed. We have taught them to protect human beings at all cost, at which point you get Jack Williamson's story with folded hands, which is the scariest horror story that I have ever read masquerading as science fiction. Far more dangerous, in my opinion, than the AIs that are going to evolve to take over are the AIs that are designed from the beginning to be evil. We already have these. Uh, the troll bots uh, inhabiting our social media are designed to instill rage and hatred uh, across our society. Now visualize uh, the up, you know, future in which uh, people are start manufacturing dead internets for individuals. A dead internet is uh, a, 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 a section of the internet where, where the target, uh, the victim, uh, it goes out onto the internet and finds that he's basically surrounded by troll bots uh, you know, he's not interacting with real human beings hardly at all. Uh, it's just as if uh, we had taken the uh, movie The Truman Show and, uh, and, and turned it over to somebody who was going to immerse you in an environment with the, with the purpose of making you into a rage machine. Okay, at that point, uh, you know, we, we will soon be able to do this to people uh, in John Blots. 
Another way human beings can, uh, can deal with the threat of being taken over is by involving ourselves. How, uh, uh, you know, how can we evolve to keep up with the machines? Uh, think, uh, the truth of the matter is we have been evolving our thinking abilities ever since we invented the ability to write. Okay. Uh, consider 20 books to 50K. Uh, it, 20 books to 50K is a society of minds that has continuously gotten stronger. In the year 2017, it was just a bunch of people sitting in a handful of rooms. Today, it spans the world through Zoom, and it spans across time through YouTube. Okay. So we are all much more powerful thinkers than we were before. Uh, if we can just get our networks uh, to support us better than it supports our patrol bots. Uh, one of the things I'm hopeful for is that we'll be able to develop AI partners that help us recognize and immuni immunize ourselves from the trolls, both human and, uh, and robotic. Even more realistic, however, than either the AI takeover or the human uh, evolution all by itself is coevolution. Uh, the most popular example of coevolution is the hummingbird and the flower. The hummingbird, uh, the hummingbird uh, feeds from the flower, and at the same time, uh, it uh, it uh, helps the, uh, the the flower with its reproductive cycle. Uh, and they, they evolved together. Human beings have evolved with other creatures over time already. This is nothing new. Uh, chimpanzees, uh, humans, uh, according to some theories of evolution, uh, we started to evolve in a different direction when we started domesticating wolves in the dogs. Chimpanzees that never developed a relationship with dogs, uh, with, with wolves, uh, uh, have these uh, strict hierarchies. There's, a, there's an alpha male who owns everything, controls everything. It is the ultimate dictatorship. Uh, but when human beings started to evolve with the wolves, the wolves taught us about territoriality which in turn led to the creation of the concept of private property, which led to the concept of freedom and the right to use your private property for whatever you wanted to use it for, regardless of what anybody else thought about it. Okay, so, so our evolution with the wolves took us in a very different direction. We did the same thing with wheat. We, see, you know, we carried the wheat seeds all around the world. We allowed wheat to populate the planet. Uh, and in the meantime, it gave us these great harvests in, uh, in the fall, which led us to think about long-term storage, which led us to think about, which led us to evolve the idea of delayed gratification, and then evolved into the idea of planning for the future. If we survive global warming, it will be because we co-evolved with wheat. Okay. This is a great picture, so I'm going to try a little bit harder to show it to everybody. So exactly how are we going to co-evolve with, uh, with the AIs? Uh, we are already running a global network in which we can, we can work with both AIs and humans without necessarily knowing which ones we're working with. Uh,
So a couple of interesting questions. Will we be able to teach the AIs how to uh, understand the context of the decisions that they're making to avoid the kinds of big data errors that they're most vulnerable to? I think the answer to that one is probably yes. Will they be able to teach us how to do critical thinking despite our desperate desire to believe whatever it is we want to believe? Okay. What's that? Two o'clock. Two o'clock. Okay. Sorry. Uh, and uh, got one more slide. This room's not up. So, uh, and, and, and the answer to that is it's going to be much harder for us to evolve the ability to think critically than for them to develop the ability to understand context. There are many science fiction stories yet to be written about the widening gap between the people who evolved to work with the machines and the people who are left behind. Indeed, the general seduction, the story that brought us here today, is a story of a person who stands on the cusp of that uh, transition. Which brings me back to where we all started. And a cautionary note. AI is fun and interesting, but in storytelling, it's the people that matter. Heinlein's Mike, the first real AI ever envisioned, taught us that you can be a person who we care about even if you are made of silicon. Ironically, the story for which I am remembered is not about AI at all. It's about an utterly ordinary woman who oh so slowly but all so surely embraces the relentlessly growing tech around her. Without realizing it, she finds herself embarking upon a journey that spans thousands of years as she acquires ever more capabilities through the machines she harnesses. In the middle of the story, one quote is, her mind had grown. She could build a starship as easily as she could pitch a tent. Too many modern movie makers would present her as someone striving towards godhood. But that is not the point of her travels, and that is not her destination. As the story's ending fades into a limitless future, she achieves a level of power and knowledge, and above all, grace that enables her not to achieve Godhood, but to, at last ex but to at last fully express all that it means to be human. We understand her because the journey she is on is in fact the same as the journey as we are all on. We empathize with her because at the end of all things, she is us. Thank you.